So, welcome um, to the Goethe Institute. My name is Annette Klein, and I'm a program curator here at the Goethe Institute. And uh, I'd like to welcome you all um, here. This is uh, one of our first in-person panels since COVID, so very exciting for us. Um, I know it's hard to get people out. Um, we're getting very comfortable. Um, I think also Misha Kubal is our first guest from Germany since COVID, so that's also very exciting for us. Um, and hopefully that will be the beginning of starting up things for us. And welcome to Juan Obando and Devin Morris, who I believe you're in the Goethe Institute for the first time, um, and welcome here as well. And also our partners now and there. Um, so before I continue, I just wanted to acknowledge that the Goethe Institute is located on land once used by the Massachusetts tribe, um, mainly for fishing, actually, since this is a swamp area. Um, and we acknowledge and express our appreciation to the Massachusetts people, uh, past, present, and future. Um, and this acknowledgement is um, a very small step toward respect and accountability to indigenous and the first peoples, and part of a process that we have begun, um, partly with the help of some of the partners like Now and There, um, with whom we are learning every day, from whom we are learning. So this panel series um, on monuments grew out of some really great conversations with Now and There that we've been having since the summer, um, and also a jo joint desire to add new voices from artists, from activists um, from around Boston, but also international voices from Germany to the conversation on monuments that is going on here in Boston um, and also around the world. But I think we're really focused on, on, on adding to the conversation here as well. And with this in mind, um, we thought that it might be helpful to set the stage um, for today's panel with a short input of what conversations are actually going on around monuments um, in Germany and here in Boston. And so I'll start with a really quick look at uh, Germany, and this is really quick. <laughs> um, and then I will pass on to Leah, Leah um, Harrington from Now and There, who will talk a little bit about what's going on here in Boston. Um, so you may all know that Germans have a reputation for loving to debate and really long, intense conversations. And I would say that this is um, not always a good thing, but often a good thing. And it's definitely been a trait that has helped them to get through a lot of their past <laughs> uh, in the past 50 years, but also um, in the discussions around monuments that they've had um, for quite a while. Um, and it's helped them to reevaluate re some of the history. And I, when I look at the conversations going on, I, I would divide them into three um, at this point. The first, I think probably all of you can guess, is trying to, dealing with their um, past, um, the history, the Nazi history, and also, you know, and all the devastating crimes that were committed in the name of Germany. And, um, Understandably, Germany has struggled very, very much with this history and uh, with the collective guilt that they've, they've had to um, figure out how to deal with. And also, I think a real um, desire to, to take and learn the lessons that can be learned from what has happened um, and, and pass those lessons on for the future so that it will never happen again. Um, so this has brought up a lot of questions for them. First of all, there's a lot of infrastructure that was built by the Nazis. Um, of course, the concentration camps, and many of those have, or most of those have been turned into museums and um, educational um, institutions. Um, but there's also all the Nazi structures that was glorifying the ideology. And I think there, Germany has had a little bit more of an issue of what to deal with those structures. They're very bombastic and um, are, it's difficult to know how to prevent it from being a meeting place for people that you want, don't want to go there. So um, it's, it's, it has created a lot of debate, and in particular, the city of Nuremberg, where the, party, the Nazi party grounds are located, has had a really tough time with this. And now, in addition, a lot of the structure is starting to disintegrate, and the question is, do you renovate? Um, and rebuild it, or do you knock it down? And I think, um, I think 
it seems to be going in the direction that there's this need to retain a lot of these structures so that it is a lesson for the future. And, um, and then the question is, how do you make it into a lesson for the future? And the interesting thing is that cities like Nuremberg are often turning to artists and um, at this point to get them to help to contextualize these areas and to bring some kind of um, meaning to them. And um, yeah, and of course there's also the process of creating monuments to memorialize what happened, um, which has been a very um, difficult process. And the one monument that you probably might have heard of in Berlin, um, which is called the Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe, um, inaugurated in 2005, took 17 years to get through all of the conversation. It was a very, very hefty um, political discussions, quite a few controversies, a few competitions, and then revised um, designs. And uh, in the end, it was an American architect, Peter Eisenman, who, um, who built the monuments. So, and of course, at the side of all this, we have artists like Misha, who is uh, um, taking on this topic as well and helping to keep an awareness alive and memories alive, which is a really part, important part of the process as well. Um, a second whole category um, of the monuments I say would say would be the communist era. There were a lot of uh, statues that were put up um, to, to um, they, they put essentially a lot of communist leaders up on pedestals. And uh, the consensus at this point in time seems to be to take them down. Um, and, but then the question is what you do with them. So this is another debate that's going on, um, but I won't go into that um, too, because we, we're running out of time. Um, I think the most interesting conversation that's going on right now is the uh, conversation of, about decolonializing decol Germany and what to do with Germany's colonial history, um, which clearly has a lot of hidden racism and, and discriminating policies that are attached to this. Um, and this has um, become a very large topic in Germany, particularly since Black Lives Matter, um, because there's been this awareness, um, and I think a population change in Germany that has been very inspired to question what um, the, the many statues of, for example, some of the emperors from Germany, and in particular Bismarck, um, who was essentially the face of Germany when it was in Africa and colonializing. Um, and there, there are some really interesting ways of, de of dealing with this. Um, the, que the big questions of whether should we should take these statues down, I think they're the same questions here. I think the tendency is going towards leaving them up and trying to contextualize them in a way. And there as well, um, in this case, the city of Hamburg has decided after actually committing a lot, many millions of euros to actually renovating one large statue of, of Bismarck that's um, stationed there, um, they've kind of backtracked and started sponsoring workshops where they've invited artists and activists and uh, to have conversations about how one can contextualize a, a, a statue like this. Um, and I think the next step is, is, is a competition so that. So this is just a little overview of what's been going on in Germany and the three topics there. Um, I would say if there's a trend, it seems to me that Germany is looking towards artists and architects um, for ideas on how to connect. Um, to their past and the present, um, and to contextualize what is there as well. Um, and I, I think that a lot of the artists are actually initially initializing all these conversations. So I think I'll stop there. I think I've taken more time than I've been given, and I wanted to pass on to Leah um, so she can give us a little bit of an idea of what's going on in Boston. Um, hi, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Annette. Thank you, um, the Goethe Institute, for hosting us tonight. I'm going to keep it really brief, but I'll just say um, I'm so excited for this conversation between Misha Kubal, Juana Bondo. Um, 
it, it's, they'll, they'll introduce themselves in a little bit, but uh, suffice it to say that I, I really think that some of these uh, cross-cultural, um, cross-idea conversations are just so important to the work that we do, and I'm so, so excited to be a part of it. Um, now in there, um, you might wonder why we're, we're involved in a, con a conversation around monuments or memorials. We do temporary and site-specific public artwork, which is why we're called now in there. Um, and we do a lot of work into thinking about uh, opening up spaces and reimagining what spaces um, in Boston could be like uh, through public art. Um, we do sometimes, we don't create permanent or long-term public artwork, um, but we often, uh, our work speaks to narratives or people uh, that need to be um, uplifted or um, have been historically marginalized. But because we're in public, a lot of times we do bump up against these conversations around monuments and memorials because they have dominated our city landscape for so long. Um, and we've organized a lot of artist-led conversations around monuments and memorials. Um, the first one was, uh, way back in 2016, which was right at the start of the takedown mo uh, movement in Boston and, and beyond, really. It was just starting in Boston. Um, and then again in 2020, um, when we were seeing a lot of um, righteous protests happening. And here in Boston, we were seeing the symbolic beheading of our Christopher Columbus statue in uh, what we now call Waterfront Park. Uh, and we also saw the, an artist-led petition for the removal of... Um, the Emancipation Group by Thomas Ball, um, right down the street here, um, which was taken down in December of that year um, after he successfully organized that petition and the city um, had an open call to hear opinions on that. Um, and we, as we were kind of seeing these conversations happen, um, we naturally kind of wanted to turn to artists and think about not only what happens when a monument is taken down, but what is kind of like that afterlife and one was an artist that I've, we've all been looking at for many, many years. Um, and we were really excited to invite him to kind of think about um, what, given his work on um, kind of reimagining futures, and I'm really synthesizing his biography here, because uh, he's going to introduce himself in a minute. But um, Juan has helped us kind of think through that with his project, Summer Sets, which again, he'll be talking about in a, in a bit. Um, I think Somerset's what's kind of most powerful about that project in a lot of ways um, is that it offers this, this empty space for us to come to. It offers up an opening where we can kind of connect the future where of a landscape where maybe there are no monuments to a present where there are monuments. So there's this really interesting crack that happens in the project, this open space that, again, he'll talk about. Um, but that's, again, why I'm, I'm excited to be here at the Goethe Institute. Um, given Germany's role in developing this idea of the counter monument from the 1970s to today. I'm really excited that Misha is going to kick us off with some of that work and thinking about how monuments are, are made instead of, you know, very permanent tangible materials like bronze to things like light and sound um, and even absence of space as well. Um, and Devin Morris, I'm excited that he's bringing, them, bringing us together once again. Um, Devin is an executive director and co-founder of the Teachers Lounge in Massachusetts. And if you're not familiar with them, you definitely should be. Um, they are dedicated to creating and encouraging spaces um, to increase the recruitment, revitalization, and retention of educators of color across gr the greater Boston area. Juan and Misha are also both educators, so I'm excited for, for the three of them to, to be in conversation. Um, and we're excited to bring this kind of content, which could be seen as very esoteric and, you know, in very rarefied spaces, kind of an academic conversation around monuments, to think about how we can bring that into um, more public spaces like classrooms. Um, so thank you again. Thank you for everyone who's online. Thank you for everyone who's in this space. It's really exciting and weird to be in an in-person talk. Um, and we're really grateful to Goethe and also to the New England Foundation for the Arts, who is helping us um, support this series. So with that, I'll turn it over to Devin, and you're going to come up here, or... Uh, thank you to Leah. Thank you to Annette. Um, thank you all for tuning in from home with us this evening, and thank you all for being here with us in person. Um, 
A big thank you to the Now and There team uh, and the Goethe Institute uh, for having me back. I joked with some staff earlier, uh, I must not have done a completely terrible job last month if I've been invited back. Uh, and so really excited to build upon our last conversation uh, with Lemurchi and Ulf um, on global monuments. And so in our last discussion, we talked about monuments, movements, um, and moments. And we talked about what makes a monument. Um, and as we sort of came to the conclusion of, uh, as a means of commemoration, we discussed who has the right to remember. And Lamerci uh, very poignantly shared with us um, her work with students in reimagining, or as she named it, representing monuments in Boston Commons. And Ulf shared his response to site-specific trauma that occurred in Kutstrauss. And both shared a concept of transitioning commemoration away from objects and into processes. And Ulf said of his installment, the community is the monument. The political struggle is the monument. And the process of engaging all stakeholders is the monument. And so I really encourage folks, if you have not had an opportunity to go back and, and tap into that um, recording to, to hear that discussion, but we also encourage you all to be very present in today's discussion. Um, and so we ask that you all at home um, be active in our chat, in our virtual chat, and Teresa from the Goethe Institute will be taking your questions and making sure that they get asked in this space. And to those of you here with us this evening in person, we ask that you be thinking of questions that you have in response to what you hear or what you don't hear tonight so that we can make sure that those questions get addressed this evening. And so in our panel discussion today, this evening, we're going to ask what role do artists play in reimagining the construction of our public spaces? We're going to explore how artists can intervene with monuments and create new modes of commemoration and community. And our two incredible panelists, artists, and educators who are here with us this evening, Juan and Misha, will, um, as inspired by, the, by localized collective action in communities worldwide, uh, Misha and Juan are going to discuss with us their current and upcoming projects, um, Juan's work with Somersets and in Colombia, uh, Somersets here and, in, and his work in Colombia, and Misha in Colombia and in Germany talk about their work and discuss, um, as we consider the afterlife of a monument and alternative approaches to visualizing site-specific trauma. And so I'm really, really, really encouraged by this conversation uh, and in by, by all of the ways in which we can talk about sort of the multiple entry points for all of the v different stakeholders who will be joining us this evening, as I said, virtually and in person. And so without further ado, I'm really excited to welcome Misha to the stage to talk to you about some of the work that he is currently doing. Thank you, Misha. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. All right. Um, thanks for having me here. And I would like to thank Annette for the kind of a scope of the situation in Germany. I'm going to refer in a minute and then also for Leo to give the in introduction about, you know, about now and there. I um, really appreciate this notion of temporary intervention. And I was introduced to that by Claire Doherty, actually, when she introduced situations in, uh, I think, in the late 90s. And it was kind of fascinating that maybe it's helping, it's a tool to operate in this very difficult territories of remembrance. And I'm glad to meet you, Juan, in person. And unfortunately, I'm not going to speak about Colombia. I was just saying in our uh, uh, prior, prior to our meeting, our um, conversation, that our school, art school in Cologne, has a, col a collaboration with uh, the students of the University of Bogota and also of the art school in Medellin. So I'm happy to share to share your expertise and I will deliver to my students then in Cologne. So um, to take it um, in a, to a serious account and um, what, what's gonna happen about this debate and I think, uh, Devin, you made it quite clear that what Ulf has said that you know this notion towards immaterial heritage, um, ephemeral, uh, ephemeral kind of uh, construction about around the theme of memory is something I'm fascinated. And I started as a performer 45 years ago in 1977. I'm not going that 
that that far back now, but I want to pick one of the projects I would say it's very important to me, which has the kind of a, um, it's a kind of a um, moment where in Germany uh, the government decided under the Nazi regime to, to um, implement uh, genocide, which was then, after this moment of the 9th of November 1938, called the pogrom, um, was not, was not um, ignorable uh, by anyone because it was so visible in the society. So what happened was that synagogues, Jewish um, um, places have been set on fire, but also uh, people have been uh, taken to concentration camps, and this was the beginning of a of a genocide which still people are trying to find words for. So this is so so heavy and so complex that I think that is not in a single artist or collective mission to uh, accommodate this and also they have been a lot of traces and, and notes and poems and compositions taking to account this um, what happened in, in that period in, in, in Germany and it was not only in Germany because the concentration camps had existed all over Europe. And it was also bringing in a lot of conflict zones um, together by the revealing who was involved and who had been collaborated. So I think that was also destroying something I would call the belief and trust between nations and people uh, inside families and something we explored later on then between East and West Germany if it comes to the let's say, elaborated spy system uh, by the GDR uh, and, and KGB system, which is now in power again in the war um, uh, to, uh, from Russia against Ukraine. So um, not every synagogue has been destroyed. And this small synagogue in, uh, next to the city of Cologne survived simply because the Jewish community has left before the pogrom. So it was just an accident. It was a random situation. And they left the community because they kind of sensed that there is something going to be happening in, in their environment and that changed the situation. So it was a farmer's house, then later on converted into this so-called project Synagogue Stommeln, which started to be very small, but started with a very interesting artist. That was Janis Cornelis, who was appointed in 91 to do the first piece there. Then the second artist was uh, Georg, uh, sorry, Richard Serra, the American sculptor, and then the third one was the first German one, that was um, Georg Baslitz. And I was visiting from the very first uh, exhibition on what's, what's gonna happen, and this is also true, like those who are on, online and those who are in the room are those who are already interested in that notion of reconsidering and taking an effort to make plans, ideas, and share um, concepts about memorance but all the others you don't reach. So I found out that the art goers would come by buses to visit that small village and to see the shows. But what do the neighbors think? And when I used the term neighbor, I, was, I, was, um, uh, I had to recall that um, in, um, in uh, fall last year, Berno Ventur and Dong, who, the new curator at the House of the Couture on der Welt in Berlin, said, uh, he was giving an introduction speech to, uh, speech to, to a work I'm doing. He said to me, Misha, the, uh, we are not talking about archives and walls. We are, we are the archives. It's in our body. And you know, Ulf and Bonob and two are colleagues at Weissensee. So that's not a coincide situation that both have a certain uh, compassion and um, emphasis on the notion of ephemeral remembrance. So when I came there, I was writing a letter to the organizers. So it's not the typical thing that the institution invites the artist. What's about the artist invites the institution to do a project which they had not been considering before. So instead of using the synagogue as a vessel for exhibitions and bring the art goers to go to that place, turn it the way around. And what happened would be the synagogue is locked, and if people would come to that door, they have been exposed to the light of the synagogue which is inside, and it was not accessible. So it, it turns, switches from um, a place to go to, a place which is not accessible, and it is like a, um, yeah, like a, like a secret space, and not many people have seen it before from the inside anyway, 
And also what it does, and this shows the next picture, um, is the connection to the neighborhood. So why is the neighborhood so important? Because they eyewitnessed what happened, depending on the generation, um, what happened when, they, when the Jewish community has left the small village. And how do we incorporate, how do we collect this memory? So this was all part of this, of this project. And um, it was also a start to engage in, um, and work um, internationally with Jewish communities. I did in Sao Paulo and also in Montevideo, not in Colombia, unfortunately, um, but also in Buenos Aires and then also in um, the Jewish Museum in Berlin. Uh, talking about remembrance and what kind of strategies and methods could, could come in, into play, here we are looking at the, um, um, the fall of 1989 when the, the German, uh, East German uh, people were gathering for a demonstration and instead of going home uh, independently they um, decided to go on a march which, which happened in, in Leipzig at the um, 8th of October. And it's important to understand that the people have been observed from the rooftops around these, these places and then the army uh, made phone calls to Berlin and asking if they should, should shoot or not. And because the answer was no, history will record this as a peaceful revolution. Can you imagine? It's a phone call making a difference for 60,000 people being shot or not, being exposed to torture, to violence or whatsoever. So I think that's a very interesting situation. And what's interesting here is that people are gathering 250,000 people uh, meeting at the uh, 8th of October in 2014 and passed this installation, which consists basically of, out of light, fog, and the people, because it existed only for four hours. And what inter what, what, what's important to know is that the city of Leipzig is turning off all the um, lights. It's not only the streets light, street lights, but it's also the um, advertising you know, it doesn't say any brands in color or whatever. So everything is in the dark. And because of the darkness, the people are calming down. It has this moment, you feel almost the gravity of this, of this um, moment you are going to remember. I think it's also important to talk about circumstances, how we can manipulate to strengthen this moment of consideration, this moment of memory. Even though if it is ephemeral, um, we need to talk about the the context. You have to understand, there's nothing to see. And people are gathering. And my, my twin boys, in that time they were like 15, they were running around and collecting voices and they said, people were throwing the coin like they do Fontana di Trevi in Roma, behind the back and with, with good wishes. No one asked, there is no choreography. It's just coming out of them. I think this is very important. The question was brought up now, what can we do to encourage and to empower people to do what they want to do and because they think it needed to be done? So I'm just giving up a few examples and we could dive deeper into that. But as you can see, because it's nothing to see, it's open to interpretation, it's open for projection. It's different from if you want to really determine exactly people should read my work, our work, Huans and my work or any other artist who has been involved in that debate in this particular way. I think this, is, this time is a little bit over. It's more to a multi-perspective, a multi-voice kind of situation. And that's why the ephemeral maybe is the longer last solution because it's it has create, will may, may create its oral history, and it's a component I, I sense from the work I did with the synagogue, it's called Refraction House. People always telling me what they have seen, and I know that maybe they never visited it, but they know from other people, uh, um, sorry, other people telling about it. I think that's quite interesting. And maybe this is another example how to address the public without preparation. I mean, most of the, of the younger generation of, uh, of artists are quite, um, how to say, mature and know how to play the media and know how to play the press. Yes, one should do. But what's happening when you do something into the public space without announcement? You are making a surprise. 
And the surprise here is that the tram people used to go to work, coal miners in the city of Katowice in South Poland, are going to enter this, uh, the, um, the, 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 how to say, the, the stop line to get into the tram and the tram just pass. It's not in service, not for you, not for us. It's just carrying something else. It's carrying the light. It's carrying memories. There's this driver I, I found, Olga, she was driving five nights completely randomly. I could not even find her. She was on her own tour. And my Polish assistant, Claudia, she was translating the emails coming from Katowice. People said, my grandmother and my grandfather was in a tram. And I thought maybe it was Olga, but it, she has no relatives. People were projecting their losses in the family, what happened through Auschwitz, talking about concentration camp. Auschwitz was a, a kind of a, how to say, ironically to say, the perfect logistic system to kill people. It's unbelievable. The first camp was like a village, also kind of a, a mediocre situation. But then the second one was, a, was organized by tracks and, and trains, and everything was about deportation. So to use a tram in the city, which is 60 kilometers off that concentration camp, was enough to be as such without any secondary commentary on it, on no text, no subtext, nothing, just by itself was creating this uh, resonance in the, in the audience of uh, Katowice. And it's also interesting that people were, that, like this car you can see over there on the left, um, was stopping in front of the tram because they were knocking on the, on the window shield to get information. People were hungry to know what's, what's going to happen, but we didn't deliver any information. So after the fifth night, the tram disappeared and it got the new um, coat, so we, we painted it white and we did all this uh, frost foil stuff. And I, I was, I need to tell you, from the idea to the realization, I think now and there is now getting a certain attention, 14 days to work all the paper for the administration. And here's the budget, $3,000, including the, the extra uh, payment for Olga to do the night shifts. <laughs> yes, so it's a quick, um, just to see how the things goes. Okay, I think this is for the moment, and we can dive deeper into uh, other practices, but I think it's, it's just, uh, you know, open the stage for Juan, I guess, yes. right? So I'm leaving this, and then you can start your presentation. Thank you. Hello, thank you so much for the people that are here, the get uh, uh, now and there, and especially uh, my two former students, uh, Gillian and Gina, that it's just really great to see young people coming out for this stuff, they're gonna be the next generation of artists and historians and curators. And I hope this is worth your coming out of the house. Um, thank you for coming. So, um, my name is Juan Obando. I'm uh, an, an artist from Bogota, Colombia, but I'm also a associate faculty at MassArt here in Boston. And I'm the co-coordinator of the MFA, low residency MFA from MassArt as well. Uh, I'm working with Now and There in a project that I'm going to talk to you about, and let me try to find where I... Oh, here it is. Thank you. So, I come from Bogota. In Bogota, of course, Colombia, and Colombia has colonization right in its name, so it's quite an amazing experience to be in a country whose name after Christ Christopher Columbus. Um, and the history of Colombia is highly... Uh, framed by these uh, overarching powers of global of globalization that happens uh, from way beyond uh, before my time, and I'm speaking not only from like Spanish colonization, but Colombia has become almost an unofficial colony of the United States through the war on drugs that has been happening for the last 50 years that has been completely exploded since the, since the 90s, and that's the generation in which I grew up and I was brought up in the 90s in Colombia, and 
it was a really interesting time for contemporary art because that was right in the beginning of what we now call relational aesthetics and later would be called social practice art and it's this kind of like relationship which, which artists started negotiating their in ways into making work that somehow solved or try or attempted to solve certain needs that governments weren't covering. So you start seeing artists creating food kitchens, artists talking about shelter and other needs that were pursued by the government in order to like supply them through artwork. And at the same time, uh, kind of like a reversal role starts happening. You start seeing government investing much more in the creation and configuration of fictions in the form of propaganda. So it's an incredible kind of like lapse in which I was, uh, I had like uh, firsthand kind of like looking at that happening right there in the 90s where like this, this dematerialization of the art form started merging into artists becoming kind of like community organizers and governments and corporations becoming more like propagandists and creating kind of like very massive fictions in which will lead us, for example, to massive international war scenarios like the one that we're seeing right now, for example, in Ukraine. Uh, in that landscape, I was really involved into skateboarding with my friends and we used to skateboard, you can see it this, in this image too well, but this is Gonzalo Jimenez de Quesada, the founder of Bogota, where I'm from. He's a Spanish conqueror. And I skated in this plaza uh, probably for three years every weekend. And if you can see the whole border of this, the edge of this plinth is covered with grease for grinding and skateboarding. And until last year, where, when this statue was knocked down by activists, I didn't even knew who he was. Like my eye level and the, my interest in this monument and the way that we monumentalize this site was through our action and interaction with it to like a very physical thing that was coming from us from a complete different angle. That's the way how we experience that space. So one really cool thing about being in a country that has this incredibly like uh, violent history of colonization and current history of colonization is that you have to find ways to survive and the, again, we were talking about trauma. The way that the colonized usually deals with trauma is through humor. Like you know that every piece of history that is surrounding you, it's a construction. And it's a construction to keep you in place. So from that um, kind of like massive understanding of what our role is in a global negotiation of our identities, you find place for humor. And this is Americo Vespucio, uh, who's the, uh, the person who kind of coined the name America for the, uh, for the cartography of, um, of, of the Americas. And if you can see it in his hand, he always had like uh, a globe of the world, and every year it gets stolen. And it's not because the takedown movement from like two years ago, no, it's been being stolen for the last 30 years. Like people just steal it. And it, it, it's this kind of like deep, like deep political or apolitical engagement with figures of power that somehow kind of like levels up uh, or creates an illusion in which we can respond in a situation in which we can respond to those type of situations. So I think like it creates a situation in which we understand history as a, manufact as a manufactured narrative that it has a very specific purpose, but at the same time, we respond to it in different kind of like uh, uh, narratives that have and involve humor in many ways. Um, this question is a very open question and very com complex question for me. I think uh, play and reimagining is a, it's, it's are many different strategies for that, but the strategies that I'm gonna talk to that inform my work, they come exactly from my group of friends in Colombia and the people that I grew up with that are from my generation and that take almost that same kind of like practices that you would see in the streets that would, people would get them to respond to these figures and recontextualize them as different art forms. In this case, Ivan Argote, for example, like worked with local crafters to make these punches and just put them on top of statues and take these photographs that are called tourists. It's a very simple gesture, but like really good. Um, my friend, Mariana Garcia. Taking a very long kiss with Bolivar, who's the liberator of the Americas. And 
this statue has been pulled by pigeons for years, so I'm hoping that she used some disinfectant. <laughs> bad because her, the title of her piece is really is really beautiful and I don't have it right now but once we get into our conversation I'll find time to find to check it. it's really good then there's Carlos Castro who's another artist from my generation who's now a professor at UCSD in San Diego uh, or California University of San Diego um, and he replicated that sculpture of Bolivar that is in Central Plaza in Bogota and he made it he cast it out with pigeon food because all the pigeons are always surrounding that area. In the videos will very well produced because it does give you the the sensation that that's the main sculpture that's in the center of the plaza and not a replica that he actually just put to the side and was able to kind of like do the shooting very well so you kind of think that it's the original one so this whole casting is made out of like weird seeds for them to eat it ends up becoming that it's like disappearing at the end the, the head falls dramatically. So I'm gonna go very quickly through two projects that lead to the project that I'm working with now and there just to get a conversation started. But just to say that I come from a very different type of um, angle in terms of what the public means. I also grew up in that kind of like a specific kind of like environment of the early 90s, but mostly my upbringing as an artist came with the internet, and the internet became the, the space that also kind of like it's an extension of that unruliness of the Colombian ecosystem. You know, it's a space that at least in the early 2000s was not mediated in the way that right now it's mediated by Twitter and Google and Amazon. It, it was a very unruly space where you would like, you, you find very, very um, intense experiences in a very kind of like con concealed or, or sealed space that was like this box in your computer. So it, it got, I got very interested lately in the way that the internet kind of like frames our uh, behavior in public space. You know, like the, like how the selfie stick becomes kind of like these accepted extensions of our body, and they also occupy this massive space in the way that we circulate cities or touristic environments. And I just started becoming very interested in this idea of us as monuments or us as these kind of like new figures that are um, just not only documenting public space, but also documenting ourselves in public space, this kind of like consumer image that we're creating out of our own projection. So I started creating these diptychs called Later Days that we're just using stock photography and the way that stock photography kind of like also trains us to uh, become consumers and how the role that stock photography plays in the city. Like if you look at the signs and billboards around a city like Boston, stock photography ma makes almost 90% of them. So it's, all, it's actually training us to behave in a very public way. So I focused a lot in these kind of like behaviors and how these behaviors became new instances in which we memorialize ourselves in public space and how otherworldly these kind of like behaviors would have been if they're documented, I don't know, 20, 50 years ago.
the series of photographs. Um, a Beer Without a Song is a piece that I really like a lot. It's based on this uh, uh, in, um, dating applications, and this one is called Tinder. It was one of the first dating applications that came out. And it seemed very interesting for me how these are also kind of like public plazas and public arenas for us to share information and to meet each other and how these um, environments have replaced a lot of the uh, interactions that we used to have uh, before in like actual public space. But at the same time, how policed and surveilled these, oh, these um, applications are and how we basically they're harvested for our data, our images, and our behavior, and for tracking our behavior as well. It's been seven hours and 15 days Since you took your love It's an oversized uh, video sculpture that plays a video loop of appropriated Tinder profiles of people in Bogota that are looking for dates in this application. And I uh, animate their voices to sing this very popular song that is very definitive of that area of massive globalization, like with MTV and all this stuff. And how, again, how this thing that it's supposed to be private, it's so public to the point that an artist can appropriate it to make work that goes back into the public in a different scale. The second project is a very recent project that I did with an Armaders Fellowship, and it's um, um, uh, kind of like a commentary or kind of like a, a, an interruption in the flow of images that was coming from the protests in Colombia from last year in 2021, inspired by the protests here in the United States from 2020. Uh, the youth in Colombia finally came to the streets to protest the probably 20 year reign of the uh, extreme right wing government of Colombia that has been supported by the United States, of course, and and committing a series of incredible uh, uh, mass murders, uh, corruption, and there has not been any ac accountability about this. And the public at large has been very silent about this, the atrocities that have been committed in the name of uh, the Colombian culture or the Colombian nation. Uh, from this particular party that has been in power with different heads, but has been in power for almost 20 years now. So uh, what was really incredible about this happening in 2021 is that the images of the protests were circulating at such an incredible speed in, in social media. And that was the way that Colombian people were knowing about these protests and people overseas. Because of course, what happens with a country that is in conflict is that many of us flee, flee out of the country. So the, the way that I was looking at these images was completely through social media and these images were just like circulating in an incredible speed to the point that they were not becoming memorialized in a way. Like they're, they weren't constructing an archive, they were just like feeding the content in uh, algorithm, algorithm within these popular platforms. But it's really interesting because you're looking at an image of these very, very violent protests that are just like people are really fighting for their lives but then the next thing that you're seeing is like a meme of like a little dog or somebody's picture of their cat on social media. So is this the perfect uh, scenario for these images to be somehow imprinted? And how do you preserve these images uh, in a way that also interrupts the, 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 the narratives, the mainstream narratives, narratives that were kind of like hiding the way that 
the Colombian youth was rebelling. And one of those narratives was the fact that the, the government in Colombia started labeling the protesters as slackers. You know, like these slackers have nothing better to do than just go out and burn buildings. They should just get to work. And this was during the pandemic. And during the pandemic, one of the main things that we were doing to work was sitting in our computer screens, uh, doing Zoom meetings or Google meetings or stuff like that. And I discovered this little device that a lot of people were using. Actually, my, doc, my, my, my doctor was using it when we were doing tele, televisits. And it was this thing that is called a web around. And it's this background that people put in their chairs in order to cover whatever is happening behind them in their like, little offices or people that were working from home. So I, I actually work with the photographers of the protests to work with their images and print these images into these web around sculptures that became kind of like utilitarian objects that circulated around people in Colombia and that also are part of these sculptural pieces. Kind of like creating a, a situation in which people could still go to work and protest at the same time and especially because a lot of students and workers in Colombia were using images of the strikes as their profile images in their meetings on Zoom, and their bosses or professors were chastising them and telling them that they will like, be fired or just thrown out of school if they would show up with these profile images of the, of the protests. So basically what these objects are able to do is kind of like to interrupt that kind of like uh, um, situation. So my work with Now and There is very highly based on those two premises, the idea of the online and the offline world, how they influence each other and how they're kind of like reciprocate the same, the, the same levels and dynamics of public space, but how problematic that is. You know, like both, we understand public space as something um, that is part of a democratic process in which we all have a say, but public space it has an incredible amount of interest from capital and government. And the same happens with the internet. The internet is highly owned, and the internet, as we know it right now, is highly colonized by big capital and big tech. So we still find cracks into those systems. We are able to intervene them as citizens and users of the systems, but it, the systems are colliding more and more and more to become less probable for that type of intervention. So when talking uh, to now and there about doing a piece that was, when we started talking was 2020 and all these statues were coming down in Boston and I was very interested in, the, in something that Misha said about this idea of like monuments that don't exist and the monuments that, or, or the monuments, monuments that will exist, how they will inform like the imagination of artists and how artists kind of like Probably the, 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 the role is more to plant a seed and then let that seed kind of like grow rather than telling an audience what an, an artwork means. And I'm very interested in that idea of, of an artwork that ignites a um, uh, type of like imaginative political thinking without being political, without having a specific agenda. So I worked in this kind of like uh, sculpture that was, um, um, a kind of like the base of a, a, a speculative statue uh, with, in the shape of the logo for the first campaign of Bar Barack Obama. And then I worked on this video, kind of like imagining what would happen if the, in the Bay of Boston you find a statue of Barack Obama that was thrown there after protesters would throw him like 40 years into the future. And what happens if that turns into a um, tourist site for selfies in some uh, version of the future. Like what happens when the people that we deem heroes become the villains? And I think that's a very interesting question when it comes to how do we assess history in terms of like rel the, our, our relativity to time and the how do we force public space and our values to align uh, to the space that we navigate in, that we live. I had this phrase here that I really like. It's a phrase from The Life of Galileo by Berto Brex and Andrea says, unhappy the land that has no heroes. And Galileo answers, no, unhappy the land that needs heroes. So uh, I really like that, 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 that sentence and that sentence actually led to the idea uh, coming up to the project. When, when we were thinking about this project, we realized that the complexity of 
making a statue and, and putting the, in it underwater in the Boston Bay probably would have been a little difficult to execute. And so we moved to something a little bit more um, uh, doable and at the same time that could be uh, way more open-ended in terms of like, it, it just, I find it very particular that Misha showed that piece because it's a piece that ev evokes rather than dictates, and I think the piece that I wanted to do was something similar to that. So, um, these images, again, these images were, as the image that I showed before of Barack Obama, they were images of people that were conceived and perceived and prescribed as heroes at some point in history. Now we have turned and our values have changed, they have evolved, they have moved to certain directions, and ideology plays a huge role in the way that we project ourselves into these figures. So uh, what will happen in, in the next, what would be the next figure that is gonna come down? What are, what are, what are our changing values? Are, what type of effect our changing values are gonna have in public space when we are really, kind of like reading ourselves of a history that we don't find that um, matches our present? And what about our future? So I was very interested in the image of, um, architectural development. If you see this image, this is actually an image that is created all in a computer. This is not a photo, an aerial photograph of City Hall. This is a three-dimensional image created in three-dimensional software for architectural models. And it's an image that we have interiorized so well because it's the image that paints progress all over the city. When you go to see an urban planning, this is the type of image that you look how, how the flags are perfectly flowing, the sky is a perfect uh, gradient of blue. So our idealized imagination of what the city looks like, it's highly perpetrated by uh, capital and by development and architecture. Renderings are a big, big part of that. I was very interested in like, wow, who makes these images? Like, they have to be so complex to make. I work in 3D rendering and making something like this has to be very complex. So I got in touch with them and they sent me some of their images. They're called uh, Design to Steel, they're amazing. So again, this is a three-dimensional construction. This only still exists as a computer file and is rendered in this way. Again, look at the beautiful flags, beautiful sky. Faneuil Hall in the back. Another view of Boston, completely constructed in three-dimensional renderings. So I was very interested in how, the, if we take the language of urban development that is usually as associated with gentrification. What happens if we use it to get kind of like a part of the city, city erased by this type of image? So I started thinking of basically covering a, a view of the statue with a rendering of its, of its background with the statue removed, but the whole image being built in three-dimensional renderings as if it was a site for development in the future. It's a very simple gesture, and that's why I, uh, I like the way that Misha talked about that, about subtlety and, and, and suggestion. That speaks to my earlier interest that I talked about earlier in this presentation, about the way of, of social media and the online world colliding with the offline world, and how do we position ourselves in public space, looking at people today, just taking photographs of Fernie Hall, I was all, again, being reminded of this, how, how we become monuments and we monumentalize ourselves through these systems and through these networks. So the proposal for Somerset is a very simple one. It's this series of erasures that happen are gonna be installed in the form of billboards and they'll have constant lighting on the top. These were some of the sites that we had for consideration. I was very indiscriminate about the sites. I was very focusing mostly on uh, male European figures, but there were some other ones that I were just um, considering. I just wanted to uh, capitulate on the probability and the many theories and academic uh, programs or um, not, not, not academic programs, but uh, academic theories that call for the removal of all, all monuments. There's a very famous man that is all, all, all monuments must fall. And we finally decided to uh, go with Sam Adams, which was the one that we had the most probability of finding support from the city and uh, timely access to permits. And at the same time, it's one that 
faces uh, a lot of uncertainty about its future because a lot of people have also uh, been, especially artists have been working with the idea and the memory and the history of this site as a site of trauma for slave trading that was happening in Faneuil Hall. So the proposal and what we're working right now is working with this architectural rendering company called Design the Steel to create a full 3D rendering of this background of the Faneuil Hall basically and installing this uh, monumental uh, digital rendering installation that is going to be lit with LED lighting all day long and all night long, so it's going to preserve its certain time of lighting as a way of us reflecting on our present, like what are our role in the what is our role as citizens, not as artists, because again, I think that it's not only artists that get to decide what happens in public space, artists throw an invitation and the invitation here is to rethink and reimagine what can happen in that empty void, in that empty space in the middle of that image. But also at the same time, not only is a reflector, but it's a projector about what's the future gonna what's the future gonna look like once we don't have these sites that are completely centered and gravitational towards a central figure that is always most of the time is male Eurocentric figure. Are we going to do something to replace it? Are we going to propose something for it? Or are we going to live with that uh, erasure as, as, as another entity? Like when you delete something, that deletion is already an entity in itself. It's not only, it doesn't delete the fact that history still remains. So this is a little bit of a behind the scenes of how the installation kind of like works. It's, I am, we're going to preserve the utilitarian view in the backdrop because it calls attention to the fact that it's almost like a movie set, like it's projecting you in that kind of, and, and also setting you up for you to perform and be kind of like a, uh, aware of the performance that we all perpetrate when we are in public. And at the end of the day, we're just very exciting about the type of activation that people can do in this space and the type of activation that we also can lead with people from now and there and the way that people will respond to one of these kind of like iconographic monuments being deleted from the landscape, but at the same time, kind of like augmented through this like very, very precise three-dimensional digital image in public space. So thank you very much. Is this okay to, to leave and close? Yeah. <laughs> Just shut down the screen. Yeah, thank you. No, I think that was the right move. Great, great, great. Um, can we just get a quick round of applause for both of our presenters? Um, so, very much like last time uh, in our last discussion, um, first of all, I'm, I'm thrown back to, I'm all set. You will. I, I will not. Uh, yes. Um, I'm thrown back into my role as a student. I'm eager to attend both of your courses. I'm eager to sit in your lecture halls and learn more. Um, there was such rich history um, as well as sort of a look towards the future. And so we won't get to dive into all of what you both um, just shared with us. But I think what I was struck by before we dive into some of the questions that we have and then encourage our attendees both in person and online to, to share your questions, um, I was struck by this concept of community engagement. Um, Misha, you talked about sort of um, the involving of neighbors who witnessed the site-specific trauma with regard to the synagogues um, as opposed to uh, making them just um, consumers as well, but they were actually involved. Um, and you talked about not telling folks how to engage with these 
public spaces and installments, and you talked about in Latzig, um, what sounded like the involvement of uh, local government and businesses, right, when turning off lights and advertisements so that folks could properly engage with the installment. And Juan, you, you, you talked about um, us as monuments, right, and this opportunity to, to sort of how we uh, consume public spaces and, and memorialize ourselves in those public spaces. Um, and I really was struck by your uh, bird without a song. Was anyone else waiting for the tiger to sing as well? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was the same. Um, and the um, Wagen Trabajadores? Yeah. So um, this stuck with me, I think, pretty poignantly because um, when we were at the height of the pandemic and so many of us were working remotely, we were living with our protests in our hearts and in our minds and, and coming back into public spaces, coming back into work spaces, particularly um, with these things heavily on our minds. And you, you found ways to um, both subtly and not so subtly bring that right into those spaces. And so um, I just commend you both for the ways in which you are thinking about sort of reimagining public spaces and reimagining these installments to center um, us as consumers as part of these experiences and get to make it what, what we want. And so I think my first question for you all, just sort of centering us in all of that, is sort of how you both use immateriality and intangibles in your work, uh, be it light or absence of uh, mythologies or histories. How did you arrive to this? And why has it been so useful to you? It's, it's interesting because I, since again, since I, I was part of a generation that was really into this idea of immateriality and situationism and creating kind of like uh, micro communities through artwork. I kind of like resisted a little bit of that. And if you see my work, the latest work that I've done is actually very mat materialized. You know, like it's a video sculpture, it's a sculpture, it's a, um, or it's a photograph or a print, uh, but the, it's because I realized that the emptiness and the, and the, 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 the absence of a work of art is always the relationship, its relationship with the audience. So I cannot imagine a piece of my work that is not activated by somebody looking at it. In, and that's why I, in, art has a very, very important role, I think, still in society because it's a medium that is asking the person that engages with it to not be passive. Yeah. And if we look at Netflix, we look at Spotify, you could just like do a playlist and just watch TV forever and yeah. die in front yeah. of your couch. But with art, it's just like destabilizes you and asks, and asks you what's your role in this piece and why are you watching this and why, why is this image uh, activating me? And I think that's, the, my, that's, that's how I arrived to that image. I realized, I, or I arrived to that idea of immateriality, or I, more, more than immateriality, I think it's absence. Like for me, the work is not complete until the, there comes to an interaction. But the interaction is not didactic in the way that somebody's gonna get something material out of it. Sure. It's that I think that, as Misha pointed out, like you plant an idea, you plant a question, and the question probably becomes more perpetual than whatever you're cemented in a gallery or in a museum. Sure. Some cases, Misha, we're, we're not even posing the question, right? And so some of the pieces, that, the, the, the installments that you left it completely to the interpretation of the audience. How did you, how did you get there? Yes, it's also causing some trouble because in, in the framework of the institution, you're always invited to enter the gallery and the gallery gives you a description and a subtitle and you get all these guidance. Sure very helpful sometimes, but also kind of a directing and pushing you somewhere and it's taking off this self-responsibility to discover, to search and to be critical to what you see, to kind of mistrust what's in front of you, right? This kind of notion, I think it's, I think institution are kind of, I mean, most of the institu institutions are also representing the status, state of mind of the political, um, idea which is which is on stake in that specific um, uh, country and um, working in the public sphere all these kind of directions are a little bit more loose I mean I know strategies including uh, transmission of ideas and, and notions and text and stuff like that 
but I intend to leave that field open to an interpretation by by audience and also by critique. So I never mix up with, with the journalist. So if the journalist says, I've seen this and that, I say, yes, you saw it, and then report this. I'm not going to correct a writer contributing an essay. So I think it's not about mixing or messing up with people's perspective. It's more embracing and also give a platform, give a stage to all these different voices. And I, I have my own opinion, but uh, maybe I use that in a haiku rather than in an essay. <laughs> um, but also, I think it's interesting uh, for me, um, I'm, you were referring to your background, and I wonder when, when, you, was, when you were speaking, I was thinking, oh, well, what is my reference to that? I would say it's squad ring building, so my concept of public uh, notion is very much, you know, um, defined by uh, the experience that people are who have the capital, have the money, are changing uh, people's life and situation. Uh, that's one thing. And the other thing is I was very much also involved in protest um, uh, marches and demonstrations. And I took it also as an art piece. I organized, for instance, a black square where I, through a newspaper announcement, I was asking people coming dressed white or black so if they're black, they're in the center, and if they're white, they're just building the frame. Sure, it's reference to Malevich's masterpiece, you know, this uh, black square from 1913, 1915, as it was established to, um, how to say, to uh, accommodate this moment of the Russian Revolution which started in 1918. So it's about the new society. There was this moment of transition when art was partnering with the, with the power. And then was also disappointed because the, the history was uh, a diff, uh, revealing a different truth. So when I did this in Hamburg, for instance, um, the, the police officer said, oh, you're so much invited as an artist to organize this performance. But what he didn't realize is that these, this black square in the city was also referring to another black square when protesters was kept in a kettle for 24 hours in 1986 when the were, were protesting against nuclear power stations in Germany, and the police white helmet were framing them. So it's the same picture with a different notion. And when I told, talked, uh, I told this, this police officer in Hamburg, then he was withdrawn from his invitation. You can come up whenever you want, just do another protest here in Hamburg. So I think you can do the same thing but the context would tell, and I, this, I think this is the power of the public space, the unexpected, the unpredictable thing. I, I think this is a wonderful energy, and COVID, um, the absence of the body in, 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 in the public space, the, the notion of quarantine and lockdown, we have to reintroduce our body. So this is my background. So the protest is also to use the body as the first instrument, the first tool to express yourself. So it's going back to the idea of choreography and, and performing. So um, I think my follow-up then for, for both of you, when we think of um, the ways in which these installments allow the take from it what they want, to give to it what they want, um, how does that evolve over time of the, 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 the length of time of the installment? Does it change anything in terms of sort of um, what, what you hope to get out of it or what you bring to the space or to your next piece of work? How, how, do, how does, um, so when you talked about the trolley um, uh, installment and how there were people who um, were telling stories that you weren't anticipating being their response to, to this, Element. I, I imagine this is what's going to happen with Somerset, is that we, we have no idea how folks are going to engage with these spaces. How does that change your next body of work? How does it change sort of your anticipation or expectations of the installment itself? Answer that with an with an anecdote. When I did uh, a beer without a song, the video sculpture out of Tinder, uh, I did that piece in 2016, and then 2019 it was at a museum in Colombia. And one of the persons that's on the video found out that he was on the video sure. through somebody's Instagram post. And they saw themselves there, and they started uh, threatening the museum to sue the museum sure. and then yeah. sue me for infringing of privacy, which is complete nonsense because the 
image was public okay. on the internet. Sure. And that image, when you upload images to these uh, 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 applications, is not even long. It's no longer yours. It's it, if somebody's okay. going to sue me, it's Tinder. Tinder actually owns those images that are uploaded there. Sure. So they're not, they're not only public part of a of a very murky type of public domain, but they are images that are owned, and that's why those companies capitalize so much because they gather so much of our data sure. and we happily give it to them in, an, in a gesture that we deem as public, but it's actually very private because it's building private capital. Um, so I was very struck by this person's kind of like aggression towards the piece because he was just standing for all of us. Like we all participate, participate in this market, right? And I could replace his image with whoever else in the piece wouldn't change. But I, what I was struck about it was this kind of like anger at this kind of like uh, moment of post uh, privacy. Like we don't have privacy anymore. We're seen by everyone. And then when we face the fact that an artist utilized our image to make a work about that specific topic sure. is when that clicks. So that interaction that I never thought would happen, that somebody would find themselves out of millions of people in Colombia that use Tinder, that somebody would find themselves in my piece, got me to this point that where I, I am today. You know, like I, I, I with, with, with a piece like this in the monumental kind of like a scale in which it's working, I'm kind of like more interested in this type of thing. I see that you have the word myth here, but I was thinking about the type of mythologies that could be built with that kind of like empty background of a city without an, an, an statue, right? Like in how people could have the opportunity to also own a moment of that kind of like fictional history that's being built or like fictional future that is being built in the present sure. and not have not me having to go and manipulate the images in the way that I did with the previous piece, but give a little bit more freedom of creativity of what ha can happen with that site how that site can be documented, how that documentation is gonna enter its way into social media because it definitely will. Absolutely. And it's set up as such so people can start uploading their videos with like that type of background, their photos, yeah. but not to control that interaction. And I'm interested of, I think we're in a, in a, like this other piece was five years ago and now we, we are very much aware of how these images are trafficked and the way that we are uploading ourselves into these platforms. So now I'm kind of like opening like even literally the window is way more open. Like this video sculpture is like this big. Now I'm gonna be working with something that's 26 feet wide. Uh, it's 28 feet wide. Yeah. So it's another type of screen. It's like a white screen in that sense, but it's opening up for people to have more kind of like agency, but at the same time for me to be able to liberate the space for people to build their own mythologies within sure. that space. And I think that's what will happen similar to Misha, what you shared different stories, tales, captured in those spaces that are user generated. Maybe Juan, as you also has it on mind, I think when we are initiating a process with the community, we are always touching immediately the question of multiplier ownership. So I found out when I do a research, like for three years, interviewing 100 families from 100 countries and I collecting all this footage, you know, 400 hours recording and and all the images which have been produced as alongside this, uh, this interviewing and uh, research project, I found in the end all this material belongs to the people. So I found three foundations to just cover the expenses and give it to a, a foundation, a museum, uh, which is able to maintain or also work with the archive and employ someone to deal with the archive and then here and then show it or give it as a loan. I think this is something um, I, I didn't, I didn't think about it in the first place, but it, now it occurs more and more. This is something you need to clarify from the very beginning. What is what is what is going to be taken out of this for you as an artist, and what is also given with your autograph and signature to the art market? Because we are not naive. We know we are in this. We're circulating, you know, even if we are producing knowledge or uh, um, um, experiences, so we share with other people and, and we're also entering a zone where this also can create value. And, um, and you, you said that, you know, people just upload their, their image, but then next moment it creates big data and, and uh, it has benefit to, to some investors. 
um, I think this has to be very clear. And also when you, the people open their doors and uh, their minds and, and telling their stories, it has to be um, certain for them that it's not misused for uh, another purpose. Um, but in the way you do it, now inviting people doing the Somerset the, the screening and, and take a photo of the memento that this landscape, city landscape, urban landscape has been changed through your intervention, I think they are also stakeholders for themselves. So they have to increase their responsibility. So I see these two notions should be kind of, kind of balanced in a way or should be also elaborated. Sure. Um, I want to ask one more question. Um, we, I have plenty more. Um, but I would love to also open the floor to uh, questions from our audience here and at home. Um, and so my last question for now, sort of, how do you see people engaging with monuments and public spaces in the future? And what do you wish for monuments and commemoration moving forward? Those two things may align, right? And they may not align, so. Yeah, it's difficult. The first question is very difficult because I'm very bad at predicting things of that scope. I think that there's a bigger questioning of public space and what public space is, and I wish that this will bring, uh, uh, and I think with Somerset's, the question is asked is what's gonna come after this kind of like iconoclastic moment that involves symbol, pure symbolism. Of course, that symbolism has effect on p real people's lives, but at the same time, it could be also a distraction for many other things. I'm thinking just in the case of like decolonization, we, uh, take down uh, an image of, I don't know, Christopher Columbus, but still we are part of a system here in the United States that's highly, it's, it's applying contemporary colonization to other countries as we speak today. And I, I, would, I would like for people to also like see beyond these kind of like symbolic gestures in what real kind of like political action they have sure. the power to exercise, which we've seen that they do have power to exercise. I think 2020 was a, uh, uh, a demonstration of that. Um, so the monument comes down, how is that changing our reality? Or how is that changing our future? Because it's, it, it, it can, it's history, in a way, it's unmovable, like we can revise it many times, but it's been settled in the way that our structures are, are built, like mm -hmm. Annette was talking about, like the, the structure of of Germany is still so like embedded with the code of its history. How do you, how can you decode that and build from those ashes? Like sometimes you have to live with that history, but how do you project to the future? How can you project a future in which the United States is not uh, a major actor in many of the interventionist wars that they're still part of and very much uh, leading at? Um, in, so, so then I'll push you on the, because I, I, yeah. I think it, it's fair to say we're not sure where we're headed. Yeah. Where would you like to see things going I, uh, with I, regard to yeah. public spaces, monuments, and commemoration? I, I, what I like to see happening, I think, is for us to um, understand that those are symbolic elements that are part of our lives and that could bring a not only healing, but conversation, debate, and, and, and advancement in our culture. I'm, I'm, I'm never, I've never been a person that thinks that removing art is a solution for anything. So I'm, I, if you saw for my examples, we love to play with statues. So please, please leave some statues up for us to keep <laughs> playing. Uh, um, but it's true, like, uh, in, a, in, 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 in uh, joking aside, I really think that public space, I, what, what needs to be protected is that the sense of communality that public space brings to us in the same, I'm, I'm talking about public space offline and online, you know, like what's happening in, the, in terms of um, uh, adjudicating responsibility to an audience it's quite a very uh, subversive thing to think about these days, you know, because we have been so uh, uh, trained to not be responsible in our media consumption. You know, like you watch uh, shows on, on on Netflix for like eight hours, strange and straight, and it's like that's binging, you know. But 
but we're such passive consumers that what art needs to do and the public space needs to confront us is that we need to be more critical in the way that we also engage with this kind of like visualization of our space that is not just about, I think this narcissistic uh, thing that came with social media is asking us that, you know, like what is next after us, you know, and like what, what is life after us? And I think public space does bring you to that question, you know, like if we're uh, uh, in a communion in the fact that we can bring these images down, what happens when we bring our own image down and how like mm -hmm. as humans we have completely manipulated the environment to just serve us, you know, and like how these lands are more than the stuff that's built on, of, uh, on them, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the next question. It's a question that kind of like relates to the opening statement by Annette, you know, like what was here before us and what will be here after us. Thank you, Juan. It's difficult to say something after you. I mean, you embraced everything almost what, uh, what is on stake, but um, I have a clear uh, mind of um, what, I, what I can see or without forecasting, but um, I don't have a, um, a glass uh, bubble in front of sure, me. Sure. But uh, what I can see is that, uh, const uh, uh, say, uh, deconstructing monuments or deconstructing um, history um, is, is showing power, is showing power, the, 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 the anger and, the, um, and also the, 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 the desperateness in it that something has to be changed, but it is not the method to be introduced how to deal. So it is, does not really work for the future. It does show what has to be done in that specific moment. And we have seen the, um, when, when Iraq was freed, we have seen that all the uh, uh, Saddam Hussein monuments have been taken down. And for most of us, I think it was a relief to see that. And it happened to uh, Ceausescu monuments in Romania after uh, 1989. And I think, and also to quote Willem Flusser, the, uh, the um, media or activist um, who has escaped from the Nazis to, to, um, to Sao Paulo, but then he was observing what happened with, with the shooting of, the, of Nikolai and, um, and Elena in front, uh, Ceausescu in front of the TV. And he said that it was a crucial act. It, was, it has an inhumane uh, ingredient, but the people wouldn't believe in Romania that they are freed from the dictator if they would have not seen it on television. So we have circumstances where we have to question our position. So I'm a peaceful person, but also I live in a country where the government instantly changed the position and selling weapons to the Ukraine to defend. So none of those people who have decided that have said that six months before. So the truth is that everything is in transition. It's an organic or non-organic process involved. It's, it's a non-linear, it's, it's under, how to say, contest, it's under, under tension. And so I feel that I'm more into that, let's say what you also shown, with the practice of your colleagues as well. So interacting with the sculptures and the, and the monuments and criticizing them, contextualizing them, changing them on, in, in a very different way, I'm, including stealing the, the globe of Americo Vespucci. But in, in the end, I think it's always dealing with it. In the moment you put the screen in front of it, there is also this illusion. It has this uh, this kind of Hollywoodian kind of a character notion that you can ignore it for a moment to to uh, to uh, provide happy life status. And I think it, it it's helping because next day it's gonna it's gonna be the same before. So the monument is not gone. So we still have to deal with history. With Germany, as Annette, uh, Annette was telling us, that, and it, it's true, that we still have the remains in architecture and the street. I mean, I know so many cities founded by the Nazi regime, and they have so many problems with the identity of the population to deal with because of that notion and the DNA of that. Um, what are you doing with this? Are you going to destroy a whole city because of that DNA? I think you have to help them to reveal that truth and to find an opportunity to, to, to work with it more um, offensively, more, more into the public, and also not turn it into a pride, which is not possible, 
but to increase the level of awareness. I, I think this is all about a coexistence. Maybe it's peaceful, but maybe that's too idealistic in a way, but at least it's controversial. And as long as you are in a debate, you are not hitting each other. <laughs> uh, as long as you talk, you are, you are dealing with the subject matter, and I think that's, and also you have to find a language. This is another problem. Now we are questioning who has the right to say something about what topic, you know, who, is, who has this empowerment. And I think we should come that we do, do not decide the society, this person has the right and this person has not. Yep. But let's make it clear who is speaking from a experienced moment or just, you know, guessing or um, attempting or whatever kind of um, uh, um, viewpoint. I think this is... It's not really a future a future perspective, but it's, it's going very slowly, actually, because this is new, that monuments has been taken down, and now people are questioning what does it need to, uh, to establish a monument, and do we need more in public space to also remember um, minorities or members of indigenous uh, tribes which are not even recognized, and Aneta was making this agreement. I know this from, from, uh, from uh, New Zealand. The Maori people always do that. Touching the nose means you know we are smelling the same air. It doesn't make the difference between Maori and non-Maori. In the moment you, you, you recognize this and, and, and um, accept this. I think I hear from, from uh, both of you this, the discourse is necessary. Reimagine public spaces, it's not enough to take down monuments, however harmful they may be, however um, uh, inaccurate of a history they tell, because once they are down, then what, right? And so what are the ways in which we are interacting with each other? What are the ways we are reimagining these spaces so that the diverse and representative perspectives of those who lived the experiences, uh, or currently still living the experiences in these spaces, are engaging with each other. And if we simply remove and put nothing else or have no discussion, then of, the discussions don't then continue after these have been removed. After to be thinking about how we're reimagining um, public spaces whether it's to hang ponchos, whether it's to steal globes, whatever the case may be, so that we can, so that the discourse does continue. Um, I appreciate both of those perspectives. I'd love to turn things to our audience um, for Q&A. Yes, one moment, we're gonna get you a microphone. sharing so much with us here. I really enjoyed it very much. And uh, that, brings me, th that brings me to you. Misha is your name, Misha? I'm Johanna. And I'm from Germany, of course. And when you said the archives are we, and do you know when you said this, it really hit me because so much I can still remember when the Americans came, I can still remember when we had to go down to the cellar, you know. And this was so uh, visceral for me when you just said that word, we are the archives, you know. That's so amazing. I mean, it's, it's, it's fascinating. And I didn't understand um, everything because my hearing is not so well, so I came up here, but when you spoke, and, and then I had to go out and excuse me, please, for not shutting off my, uh, my <laughs> iPhone. Sorry about that. And so I didn't quite, um, with the train, with, with nobody in it, right? The symbolism of it, I mean, of course, it goes back to the trains, you know, when they were transported and all of that. And so, the, so I thought that what you did with the white light, you know, the, this, just, this is also amazing. I think this is a very powerful image, you know. So you are symbolizing <clears throat> the trains which were going to, to the, uh, to the uh, uh, concentration camps, I assume, yeah. Yes, I need to be honest with you. Um, yes and no. Uh -huh. Okay, I think that makes a difference. As I said, I was not trying to symbolize that 
the trains for the transportation, deportation was arriving in, in Auschwitz. Right. And it's interesting that when the Polish people say Auschwitz, it's always the concentration camp because yeah. the name of the city is Oswizm. What? Oswizm. Ah. Okay. So then, because the German aggressors didn't like this pronunciation, so they yeah. called it Auschwitz. It's a Germanization of the word of Oswizm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's, it's very interesting. And then, then when the Polish people use Auschwitz, it's always the Nazi concentration camp. Yeah, so yeah. there is a distinction in the language. As I said before, we can, we can get into more details about that. And the other thing is I was transforming a functional tram into a dysfunctional tram. And people were kind of offended by, oh, I'm expecting the train to come. I see the lights in the evening and then... This whole thing is just white and passing by. So that was kind of a an, an, an kind of an aggression. Right. I wanted to have this kind of sculptural moving element. I, uh -huh. I like uh -huh. okay. I like if things are nomading from one place to another and then telling different stories. I have different works dealing with that, and I think Leah was pointing that out. I think one of those pictures, Dysotopia, a truck driving through a city is irritating but also claiming something yes. to those people so then the reaction was oh my grandfather was sitting in that ghost yeah. tram also because of the name of ghost tram it became a narrative yeah. in the city ah, I see. Okay, and then people you. started to project it was not my attention mm. because i think as a german artist it's a little bit more yeah. than offending to come to poland and tell pe polish people how to look at yeah, this experience yeah, yes right. Exactly. It's, thank you. I wanted to level myself. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Johanna. Teresa is going to ask us a question from our online audience. Yes. So David Rubin is asking: Should we build a monument to COVID? Which current issues, movements deserve to be commemorated with a monument? Very quick answer. I like the question because I think that a lot of people are thinking about it and I think there's also a lot of artwork referring to COVID because it has had effects and maybe will still have. But the monument already exists. As I said before, you know, it's us, you know. The half face with masks and all this breathing and all this uh, distances and social distances. When I heard this word first time, I thought this is quite the opposite I wanted. I wanted to do. I want to hug people. I want to get in contact again. I want the physicality, the tactile. I want the whole thing, not just, you know, parts of it. So I think this already exists as a monument, as an experience we have and we share. And it's a worldwide one. So it is also nomadic. It's existing in different cultures and, and nations. And it, that doesn't um, happen to, to bother by frontiers. <laughs> And going back to that quote of like sad the land that need is heroes, I also think that we need to revise, or we could revise the idea of why do we need more monuments and how, why monumentalization is still important and look where it's gotten us. I think the, the, um, this type of hierarchical thinking that it hides itself as democracy, but that it really kind of like uh, it's another articulation of power, of the language of power and monumentalization needs to be revised. Like, why do we need a monument where we are walking monuments ourselves and our histories? Again, I go back to that first image that I show. I never knew that that was Gonzalo Jimenez de Quesada, the, the, the founder of my city. I, the, the, my memory of that monument is that I loved going out there and skating with my friends and just like waxing the curb so I could grind better. And I've always, that's gonna be my, the, my version of that monument. So our reinterpretation is already so like uh, primal in the way that we inter, interiorize experiences that I really think that we can live a life, a non-monumental life and still be memorial about the experiences that we have. And I think COVID is, it's, it's in us, you know, like in many of the experiences that have been traumatic or uh, are happy for us, they just like still stick with us. And maybe the, the need for memorializing something speaks for how maybe it's not so important that we need, if something's not that important, maybe you need to memorialize it, you know. I think it's an interesting question. We. Um, 
most succinct answer I could give, uh, you, and I'm sure the question wasn't for me, but um, <laughs> um, too soon, right? We're still in it. We have not, uh, when we talk about memorialization, when we talk about um, monuments, however we are defining them as experiences, as discourse, um, as, as figures, uh, physical objects, or what have you, um, we need to have come out on the other side. I think we're still very much in it right now and don't know the long-term effects of um, what I would say beyond COVID is just the multiple pandemics that we've lived through uh, and are currently still living through. So it feels like it's too soon, though, though there's much discourse happening in the moment, very much like this one. Um, but it feels like it, it will be uh, commemorated somewhere, somehow uh, coming out of all. Hello, thank you for presenting. Uh, I think we're living in a very interesting moment and your presentations were very interesting because you provided a lot of historical context and you provided a lot of current globalization, technologization context. And um, an artist that I think about a lot is Aweiwei and how he kind of is very polarizing and very, and challenges a lot of ideas to the point where he becomes unsafe. So as an artist dealing in a globalized world where, you know, big technology companies are now the government and censoring uh, artists, how far can an artist go before, you know, they're unsafe or their ideas are too polarizing in today's context? Well, our artists are very good at hacking those systems. Uh, and you don't need big technology companies to mo mo moderate the conversation in a community. And I can tell you from like growing up in the 90s in Colombia, it, 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 the conversation around contemporary art was completely dominated by three major museums that never looked at our work like at all. Like they were really focused on like painting, abstract painting back then. So in a way they were censoring the way that we as young artists would enter that system, right? So it's not similar from the type of stuff that can happen when you like, I don't know, like upload some like type like weird video to YouTube and all of a sudden gets taken down, right? You don't, you didn't have, as young artists, we didn't have access to these spaces that were support, supposed to be supporting us as artists. And what we did is that we started like doing like a garage galleries, you know, like we started doing independent art spaces and the whole history of independent art movements is basically a response to censorship and, 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 and segregation. Like basically we were not part of like a major conversation that was what was considered like high art at that moment in the history of the country. And we said like, why don't we put some money together and, and rent a house and we start doing shows there. And turns out that a lot of people really needed that. We started getting a lot of people coming to our shows uh, and it started kind of like redefining the history of young Colombian art in that moment. So the same with technological companies. I think we are in a, what uh, some people call a new dark age. Like we're completely over-informed, scrolling all the time. We, we don't even know how to save images or like create a website, you know, like uh, create, uh, those are the, the bricks and the way that structures are built on the internet. And if we are not kind of like knowledgeable how those structures are being built, and we just like are left with the shiny screen and the likes and the followers, then we're in for a rough ride. I think we, not only artists, but general people, we need to be more literate in the way these systems operate and how they're built in order for us to build alternatives to them, even if it's online or offline, if you're putting a show together with artists in, the, in your apartment, you're already doing a lot to keep that type of like countercultural and kind of like questioning art alive. And on top of that, if you learn how to create your own platforms, how to navigate, create different networks of distribution on the internet, there's still a lot of ways in that kind of like art thinking is what gives you the power to, to not be complacent to what you we what you have, right? I think we had one more question from our audience. Hi. Oh, that was very loud. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts on 
memorials or monuments being made as sort of a performative act rather than trying to actually make a change. And so I'm sure this happened a lot the past two years. I think one example would be, I think in New York, um, a hospital really needed more supplies or something, but instead there was just a statue put outside the hospital um, commemorating all the nurses and doctors and patients who lost their lives. Um, I know that may seem a little apples to oranges, but what are your thoughts on that type of performative action versus monuments and memorials that are actually made to honor people? <laughs> well, uh, Gillian, I think I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go back to one of the things that I started my presentation with, is that uh, we are in a very difficult moment in which artists are like called to provide solutions for social and political problems, and then politicians become more propagandists than image makers. And that's a very difficult moment in which we are, and we need to make a distinction and actually fight, I think, fight against it and reclaim our, our place as, as, as hackers of the popular imagination and not providers of like social solutions, right? Like we are educated to, 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 to compete in the visual landscape and in the visual realm. And I, and I think that's what's so beautiful about art, right? Like it liberates you to get to that space. But when issues like that happen, what you're saying, like we've seen that happening so much and I think uh, systems of power are so good at dealing with symbolism and that we have been accustomed to the fact that symbolic wars are real wars and that the reality of our environment, be it local and global, is navigated or negotiated through symbols. And there's not much to say about that, that as, as, again, as artists, we need to reclaim our role in really kind of like hacking the imagination of the of an audience to kind of like propel some type of like I, either speculative or imaginative political thinking in other people that they can provide solutions, right? And if we understand that we all have different capacities in a society uh, as storytellers or narrative creators to other people that are inspired by what we do, I think that's more than enough for us, again, as people that we actually, we do deal with symbolism and that's our realm. So it's, it's, it's very difficult for me to gather an opinion, opinion more than opinion. I, I think I, I have a very uh, set stance of where, where, I'm, where I'm standing, you know? I'm, st I'm working with the, with the universe of images and, and fictions and I, I, I think that it's important for me to not only stay in that space but being able to kind of like expand from that space rather than going into a space of like policy making or social change that would require me to, to leave the world of fiction that I pretty much adore. You know, like the way that we can ev ev evoke uh, uh, an experience just by feeling a, a, tr a public transit with white light, you know, with re with, without really having to go into the history of what would reparation, to, for example, to the Polish people would look like, you know? But how can that image circulating the city can inspire other people that really can make that change and for us to also keep building our arena. You know, our arena is, is imaginative, for me, it's imaginative thinking and creative thinking towards possible other worlds. I hope I did get you right. Because I think that's, that's I needed to, to think about because this response is not that easy. There was a moment where, I think it was Italy and Germany, when people were applauding from the balcony about this unbelievable uh, engagement of all these people in the hospital, the doctors and nurses, and everyone was involved. And everyone was also giving this credit to the people. And one day, these people turned around and said, we don't need your applause. Get vaccinated. So. That was one reaction. And the other thing was that the German government was acknowledging that on a very high level. There was non, non a single speech without you know, giving benefit to this kind of um, emphasis and, and work involved. And people were really working an arm and a leg off, right? 
And then three months later, the, these people have been interviewed again. So there was kind of a, a memorial, not in the sense of out of bronze cast, but it was, you know, they were highlighted in the, in the, in the, in the society. But then they said, we'll still get not paid better. So everyone promised you we will be, have a better salary and you, you need to, you, you deserve it. And this is the thing. Memorial may do not really refer to what is needed in the society. Maybe, maybe this is an counterbalance to what, you know, I mean, the historical thing we cannot change despite we can, we can moderate this, we can contextualize it, we can perform it, and we can also, I, you use that word humor, which I think is a very good energy also to, to make big things looking small, right? Yeah, or, or small things look, look, look big the other way. So I think the problem was this idea that we sit now here and then someone asks, what's about the COVID should we think about? And I think, yes, give it some time and then someone will come up with something and maybe it is, it is a, it's a, it's a, it's a poem which is driving from through different translations as a global thing and people are like likely feeling like quoting it and this creates a collective memory. I would plead for less materialization and as Juan said, um, get rid of the idea that monumentalization is going to be the solution for the next uh, two centuries to to kind of you know create this memory, I would really trust. And you know, and Johanna was pointing that out. This, what, what I was introducing, this, the body as the archive, is not my idea. There was, there was uh, Bonaventure's. Um, uh, I'm, I'm quoting him because he said that this is a wrong conception in the in the Western world that everything needs to be placed in a museum. And he said the museum. That's we. We are the museum. We have all this material inside of us. And as you said, you have easy way to have access to your memory because you need a trigger. And this is what maybe a monument can do to trigger either the aggression against the um, injustice or to create something which is embodied in yourself. So the psychology has this called, this name is called imprint. So it's really something we have engraved in our cells and it is in our muscles and we can activate that. And I'm working in a think tank, it's called transgenerational traumata. And you don't believe that people who have never been exposed to a concentration camp, generations later, they still, they still recover. I mean, they still, you know, think about it and feel it and that they sense it and it's in written in their in, in their DNA and I think this is really fascinating and to to de to also to better understand the complexity we are we are not as simple as some people want to believe us I like um, this from both of you this this concept of um, artists planting seeds that seed sparks the conversation or the dialogue and maybe even sparks the change, great, but it not being the responsibility of the artist. And so um, I would encourage you to go, again, go back to, and all of you to go back to our last discussion where Ulf and, and Lemurchi, we talk a bit about processes and the ways in which we are in selecting, and, and I use King Boston's uh, recent or upcoming installment as an example of community engagement to determine then what comes of this monument or this commemoration. But the community engagement helps, to your point, determine what is the need, um, what, what, is, what needs to be created in this space rather than sort of the, the artist uh, holding that, bearing that burden of responsibility of, 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 of um, shame and judgment for the fact that there were other needs that, that this hospital that you named um, was in need of and that separation so that art can be the art. And if it plants seeds and it sparks change, great, but that's not the responsibility of it. Um, and so this is a really great segue to, cl to close things out, but sort of um, um, encourage you all. Uh, Somerset's, I believe, is running from July to August. Um, and so I encourage you all to please go and check that out. I'm, I'm thoroughly excited to continue our conversations offline and continue to be, stay connected and follow each of your works uh, from, from near and afar. Um, 
But this concept of uh, just a challenge to all of us here um, as both artists and consumers in the ways in which we advocate on behalf of the reimagining of public spaces, um, I think it's one of those things, I would say personally, before I stepped into these dialogues, um, I kind of assumed was just the responsibility of the, the artist. And when you realize how so many community stakeholders play a part in um, this work and the decisions that get made um, when we come together as a collective to, to um, reimagine spaces, but also reimagine sort of how we engage in those spaces with each other through discourse and interaction with the, the pieces of, of, of music that we create. Um, it's a really great challenge to us all to, to, to be active consumers and participants in, in that. So um, I thank you both for your, for your work, for, you for, for your time this evening and, and, and your sharing your truths. I thank you all for being here this evening. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn things over to no one. Great, everyone have a great evening. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. I, when I tell you.